All right, and we are live. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me early this morning. Uh, also, thank you so much, David, for joining me. It's not as early over there, but hopefully you're doing well. I'm great. Thanks, Ben. Awesome. Uh, then for everyone just kind of jumping in, do you want to give a quick background on kind of, you know, who you are, uh, what 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 your role has been in kind of the data world uh, for, for a little bit now? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to dive into it. So I'm Dave Yaffe, co-founder of Estuary. Um, so we are a real-time data company. Um, our belief is that it's too hard to work with data that's low latency, and we're trying to change that from the ground up. But the way that we got here was um, we, I had been in the ad tech space for a long time. We built demand-side platforms. If you've heard of DoubleClick, Bid Manager, that's one of them, um, and also other other types of ad platforms and martech platforms. And the common thread of most of those is that it was one of the earliest places that real-time data became important. Um, and, and also like very, very high scaled real-time data become important. So a lot of tech innovation happened in them in those, those spaces. And, um, you know, it led to kind of some of the stuff that we have today. Um, I think when most people think of real-time data, they think of like finance, um, but, it's not necessarily just that. We have systems like ClickHouse, um, Druid, Kafka, right? Kafka came out of LinkedIn. Druid came out of MetaMarkets, which was a, um, an ad tech company. Um, and ClickHouse came out of Yandex, which was an ad tech company. Um, and they, they all kind of came out of the same type of origin. So myself and my co-founder, um, we built a previous business to this one, which is actually called Arbor. Um, and Arbor was one of the fundamental beliefs that we had was that real-time data was super important for it. We wanted to make sure that everything we could do would be in real time, but we also wanted to be not lose all the access to like historical data that you usually do when you're working with real-time data pipelines. So we ended up building some tech around that. It was called Gazette. Gazette is a streaming system. It's kind of like Kafka, um, except that it's natively backed by cloud storage, making it really easy to retain data for long periods of time. So. That's the journey that kind of led us to build Estuary. Estuary is uh, taking Gazette and making that a lot simpler so that it looks a little bit more like a point and click UI. I have my sources, I have my transforms, I have my destinations. Let's make that whole pipeline run. Yeah. So in terms of like kind of that whole experience, when you, when you started um, essentially in the data world, why did you start seeing essentially the the demand for for real time data? Like, what were the actual use cases besides obviously you you referenced finance that people are like, oh, we need real time data, and and this is why. Yeah. Um, so the martech ad tech world is a place where it, it's kind of a cu customer in the loop use case, right? A customer is on a website and they express interest in a product by searching for it or doing something like that. Um, if I search for a pair of shoes, I probably want that pair of shoes right now. And I'm the type of shopper, at least, I don't know about everyone else here, who in the next 30 minutes, I will not be interested in that pair of shoes because I will have already bought what I want, uh, most likely. And and that's kind of the way that the world works, right? Like, And so it turns out we did a study when I worked at Google, which is one of the previous companies that I built a DSP for, um, that about 65% um, of, of the value of getting back in front of someone comes in the first like five minutes, right? So mm -hmm. that's really important. Um, and so real time technology is very important there, but really any customer in the loop use case makes a lot of sense, right? If you, your customer is doing something and you're supporting them, like you're a support person and you don't know what they have been doing in your platform, you have no visibility then you probably aren't going to be as good as as if you had have it more um, more visibility into what they were doing. So those are the types of use cases I think are are super important. That's that's what brought us to this as well. Yeah, yeah. And then like when you're having to like make those those um, decisions, you know, for for trying to build this like you know Martech ad tech kind of platform, um, what were the options that you really guys you you had back then in terms of like real time solutions? Yeah. So. This was, I mean, I've been building these things for like 15 years. So back in the earliest of days, there were not too many options, right? We, we used a uh, rabbit MQ. If you remember it, it was a message bus. Um, 
really like a queue of, of messages that you send from one place to another. And it doesn't have too much intelligence. It's just a way of, you know, queuing something and making it happen. Um, but really, like, I think when we're looking at the data landscape, the, the real-time data landscape, there's kind of three concepts, um, or maybe four. So extraction uh, from your source systems. If you don't extract it in real time, you lose it at the source. Um, and so that's not doing a SQL query that says select star, right? Because you can't keep that all the way up to date. That's more like looking at a system's right ahead log and seeing every single transaction from that right ahead log and being able to extract it. So the second thing is transporting that, like you have to take it and put it somewhere, then you have to transform it, that's third, and then load it somewhere. And all those things have to be real time if you want a full end to end real time data pipeline. Um, so on that spectrum, we had, you know, for the transportation layer, things like Rabbit, not too much on the source side. Um, you, and then on like the loading side, you'd get um, technologies like um, Redis was available. You know, Mongo came out, I think, in 2007, so a little bit later. Um, Memcache um, was another uh, another service for like loading the data, but really it was all in its infancy. There was no there was a pub sub model, but no real um, consumer framework for for taking something and processing it in real time. Yeah, so it sounds like like even even if you like wanted like there was no ability to like take one of these pieces and put it all together. It sounds like it sounds like it was a lot of like piecemealing, a lot of solutions like. Um, and like RabbitMQ and trying to get to a place that's like real time esque. Um, are there like I'm just curious because I imagine you know when you start trying to put these things together, what what are the things that like you'd run into in terms of like problems like as you're trying to scale, as you're trying to get bigger, when you're trying to put all these pieces together, um, like that you feel like you've seen people run into a lot. Yeah, I think there's a there's an answer for that historically, which is very different than the the current answer. Um, the current answer is actually there's a lot of scalable pieces that you can choose off the shelf and they're horizontally um, distributed. And so it, it really makes it possible to, to scale. Um, there are difficulties, um, just complexities with scaling something like Kafka, for instance. Um, and that's the reason that the company like Confluent has grown so large. Um, but in general, they're all possible to do, right? Like if you have enough engineers and enough brain power, you can totally do it. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, I think when we were building companies uh, that were using real time data, it was, it was really like taking a lot of pieces off the shelf and trying to make um, the fit, them fit together in a way that could be um, real time and solving the specific use case that we wanted to solve. So it took a lot of um, optimization and building of distributed systems and, you know, instead of plugging in a distributed system, we were building distributed systems, um, which which was a lot different. Yeah, I think um, uh, I always think of, of when I worked at Facebook to think about like, oh yeah, like you get enough engineers together, anything can scale, right? Because uh, their their whole backend is like MySQL. And it's like, yeah, it's not supposed to scale to the size that it has, but it has, it, it works. Like don't, you know, it's, it's it hasn't died yet, so. Um, I mean, you know, Impressive. yeah, I don't, I don't know who built it or it was probably a team of people who whoever built it, like, you know, obviously, obviously built it to actually manage all of that. Um, in, in terms of like, you know, going from where you, you originally saw the, the real time world to where it is now, like, what have you seen in terms of like evolution? Like, has it been kind of this piecemeal, like someone fixes one part, someone adds another component, like, how has it kind of been in terms of like, Putting all these components together over the last uh, few, few, like almost a few decades, uh, to get this to where we are. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a good question. It's it kind of really depends on your use case. I think because um, a lot of people, when they <laughs> when they actually use a real time system like Kafka, they I've, I've seen the you know lots of different architectures, but a lot of times they'll use that just to transport all their data. And then when they're actually doing analytics, they're dumping it into a data lake, which is not no longer real time, right? Like, cause you're, you're going to query it um, every so often and stuff. Um, and so that's one of the, the funniest things about it. Um, 
So really, depending on your use case, you set it up very differently. Um, you could, if real-time analytics is what's important to you, you're going to be using a stack that probably includes a, a tool like Materialize to do real-time analytic queries, or you know some of the newer Snowflake features, um, you know something like that, um, that help with unpacking dynamic tables so that you can load data in real time and then uh, get queries that that actually work for an analytics person. Um, so I, I really think like it's just it's the use case. It's totally use case dependent. We have a lot of tools off the shelf right now. You can put them together in a, in a nice way that that um, that solves any of those use cases. And um, but picking the right tool to the job is the the difficulty here. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of like you referenced like Kafka, people kind of just using it to drop in, like data into a data lake, and then like okay, it's not really real time anymore unless that data lake somehow connected somewhere. Um, like, where do you see Kafka actually being used in real time? That's like useful for an end user. Yeah, um, I think loading uh, more operational systems is a, is a great place to use it. So. If you're going to be um, loading an operational system like a, a caching layer, um, so that could be a NoSQL store, document store, something like that, or um, funneling data into a transformation system like Blink or Spark, and then actually using it for real-time analytic, um, real-time analytics or real-time operational analytics, those those are great places to use it. And, and super common. I find that Kafka is generally used as an ETL layer, right? Like it's the T part of the ETL layer. Mm. Um, and that's the primary use case that's emerged from it, right? Most big businesses are, are using it as a connective tissue within the organization. Um, and so that's, that's good. Even if you're not using it for, for its real-time capabilities, um, systems, streaming systems like Kafka are really good for doing that because they tend to talk to a lot of different systems and they, you can, you can kind of configure them to, to how you want. Yeah. Um, and then just, just so that more, like more people kind of get a good, good understanding, like I feel like ClickHouse and Druid are often kind of referenced very like close together. Like where, where do those play in, in, in the real time world? Cause I think they have kind of a unique space, um, in general. Yeah. So they're, they both, you know, as, as I kind of mentioned before, they both came out of ad tech. Um, so ClickHouse um, came out of Yandex, um, and then Druid came out of MetaMarkets. And ClickHouse uh, basically was a place that you'd go and you'd shove a whole bunch of event data, so raw events as they happened. And in the ad tech world, there's tons of them. There's billions of them. So it had to scale really, really well. Um, and because of that, you know, they, they ended up building this really nice layer. It's kind of similar. It's an OLAP system, kind of similar to like how Snowflake works. Uh, open source, you could roll it yourself if you wanted to. I'm sure it wouldn't be super fun, but you definitely could. Um, and Druid is kind of similar. Um, it's uh, a little bit different in that I think it does a lot more ahead of, ahead of time caching and indexing. Um, so it pre-computes a lot of what the queries are that you're going to be trying to, to run against it. But both kind of have come out of similar similar concepts. You have tons and tons of data. You want instant queries, um, and they have to be they have to be over a, a huge amount of data. Maybe uh, joins are a little less important for you. You have a, you know like one big table type of thing, um, but they they can do joins. I think, but they're, they're a little bit less good at it than than um, you know, other R uh, relational systems. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I think I know, like, I, I don't know what ClickHouse's architecture is underneath, but I know, like Druid, like, requires you to have like several kind of nodes and services essentially to be running for to to operate, um, which is both good and bad. Like on one side, it's like, oh yeah, you can scale almost as as you scale those components, but you also have to be able to scale those components, which has its has its own challenges. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just getting started, right? It's not going to be uh, simple to get started. It's a kind of commitment. So they both tend to be used by much bigger companies for the most part. Um, if if you're going to roll it on your own, the interesting thing is they both do also have SaaS vendors that are deploying them. So Imply for Druid and then um, ClickHouse for ClickHouse. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I mean, that, that that's the current current method, right? Like build or take an open source project 
provide a managed service for it if it's popular and you know the maybe maybe it'll work out so i think that is pretty pretty standard right now Absolutely. So I guess fast forwarding, you know, to, to now, right? We've, we've talked a little bit about the past in terms of what real time data was like, uh, and like the solutions that we had. Like, what are what are what are you starting to see in terms of like the demand for real time? It's definitely increasing, right? Like, I think when we started Estuary, um, uh, when we talked to potential customers, a lot of them would say, "I don't know if I need real time data or something like that," um, but I think there's kind of two things that are happening at the same time. One is that it's getting a lot easier to do basic use cases in real time. Um, so things that you have an alternative to do in batch systems, like just ETL, um, now pretty straightforward to do it in real time. Um, so that's one side of it. The second side is that there's actually more data available in real time through solutions like change data capture um, or even real time APIs. Uh, when, when we looked, at uh, marketing APIs, for instance, back a few years ago, most systems did not offer real-time endpoints, but now they do. Salesforce, HubSpot, um, those are CRMs, obviously, um, Intercom, you know, basically any major marketing system is going to offer a real-time endpoint. Um, and that, that extends to other important places, like, of course, finance and other types of vendors offer those and have, have for a very long time. Um, so I, I think that that has all led to it being a pretty, um, a pretty uh, a field that's really increasing in um, desire. So a lot of usage. Um, so when we talk to people now, the usually what we hear is that they they're pretty interested in thinking about their real time system as well, um, and they usually are starting maybe in one or two use cases, but overall thinking about expanding that. Yeah. You know, do you feel like there's any like uh, verticals or teams that are you're really seeing it besides besides marketing? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I, I mentioned like anyone that any place that there's a business consumer in the loop, and that's actually that extends far beyond marketing, right? Sales, services, any of those software makes sense. But like logistics, right? You have um, maybe a, a fleet of people who are um, actually delivering products somewhere, you need to know where they are. Otherwise, you, you can have a bad time. Um, travel, um, another like person in the, the loop use case. Um, you have a plane, you need to know where the, that plane is. Um, so definitely for like airlines, we've seen that a decent amount. Um, and finance is another good example. So those are just a few just examples of industries that that make sense for it and and kind of use cases within those industries as well yeah do you do you feel like uh just because i feel like i've been digging, digging into this a little bit recently like there's like the retailer and like cpg kind of kind of like problem where it's like oh retailers know what data has been sold like what products have been sold and cpgs maybe don't and so they they kind of have this gap do you see that kind of space as well as is growing in need for for real time I think actually a little less just because most of that data isn't really available in real time. You know, you yeah. have two companies that have um, generally like a little bit more legacy systems where their data is stored and it's uh, it's harder to access it with low latency than than in other places. Usually when we're talking about that use case, I, I find that it's flat files that are sent in emailed or, you know, <laughs> shared shared with each other. So that tends to be much more difficult to do something with low latency. Yeah, hopefully not in emails, but uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I guess, you know, go, going past use cases in terms of implementation, like do, do you, where, where do you see it fitting more specifically like in analytics, right? Like going, going away just from operations, but like, is, are there use cases you're seeing in analytics where people are uh, looking to get data in real time? Yeah, I think it, operational systems. When you're when you're looking at like any of your operational systems that are um, powered by databases, which are most businesses have something like that, um, those use cases tend to um, uh, you can start to understand your data with low latency, but um, it probably doesn't make as much difference once you when you're just doing that level, the understanding your data with low latency. As soon as you want to action off of it, as soon as you want to like say, well, 
Um, I'm seeing that at 7 a.m. a whole bunch of users come to our site and, you know, we want to reach out to them for some reason or something like that. That's when it makes sense to say, oh, well, now I need to land that data in real time. I can't go back and, you know, do anything with it in real time unless I've already landed it in real time. So that's like the, the kind of chicken egg problem that we, we see happen a lot where uh, you only realize you need that real time insight once you already have the data and you've come through it and you're starting to like take the next step of the data journey to start actioning. Um, so that's, that's the major thing. Um, we do see, you know, it's, it's nice to have low latency data too, right? Like when you're actually making changes to a setting and you're seeing if it took place and that's, it's just really nice to be able to um, watch something happen live and not waste like minutes or hours waiting to see and remembering to come back to something and checking if it worked. Um, so yeah, those, but like, those are the types of use cases, I think. Yeah. So I, do you, do you feel like you're still seeing like a lot of like that, like back to back systems where people are doing like maybe batch for some parts of things and, and real time for, for other time or other parts. It's so funny. Like when we talk to a business, a lot of the time they'll have two, um, two lines of business. One will be their analytics department. And they'll have they'll be doing CDC effectively out of a database, one of their operational databases for analytics, and they'll be doing it in batch uh, using you know Fivetran or something like that. And then they will also have a separate team that's doing something that's more operational, so building out data products, and they will be doing CDC from the same database sometimes, and doing that in, in real time. Mm -hmm. And so you have like these exactly the same data pipes that have been built on two different teams that didn't talk to each other. Um, hmm. doing kind of the same thing. And that is like really common. We hear that over and over surprisingly. Um, yeah. And so it, it feels like a lot of inefficiency sometimes where like you could just land that data once and then kind of use it for both purposes or land it in two places using um, something like a streaming system. Um, so something like estuary um, <laughs> and then be able to um, use it for both analytics on one side and operational data on the other. Yeah, I, I think it's always interesting when you, you come into companies and, and find that they're often doing the same thing uh, in multiple places, uh, whether that's because people don't talk to each other or they, they just wanted to own it both themselves. I think that that often happens a lot more than we, we care to say. Um, you, you referenced CDC a few times. So I thought it'd be interesting if you maybe said, like, what is CDC, you know? Sure. Yeah. So the... The standard way of getting data out of a database is to query it, right? Like you, you query the database, you get an answer, select star, and then you see what, what's there now. That's not super efficient when it comes to larger data sets. So um, over time, you know, people started figuring out different ways to query a database and get only incremental data out. That could easily start with like querying the last modified date or something like that. Um, and then you query at a, a cadence and get only new records added to your previous records. But you're still missing certain things like deletions. You have no idea when data was deleted from that source. Um, you're missing, and it's also high impact on your database, right? If you're actually doing queries every so often, as your database gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that's not going to be great for it. Um, so I think uh, maybe around 20 years ago is when it first started, 15 to 20 years ago. Um, people started saying, well, what if we could actually look at the transaction log of the database? That's every single change that happens internally in the database and then reconstruct what's happening um, based on that. Um, that's the, that, that has two distinct advantages. One is that you get the ability to um, not query the database, right? All you have to do is look at the transaction log, see what's going on in there, and then you can mirror it somewhere else. And that's much lower impact on the database because there's no queries. Um, and so that's number one. Number two is that it's much more granular data. It's like actually the same data set that the database is using to construct its own set of queries and its own understanding of the world. Um, so you, you end up with um, a lot more power, all of the deletions that you want, much lower impact on the database. Um, and so that's something that, that uh, you know, it's a tactic that's become really, really mainstream these days for being able to extract data from from any type of database and, and put it somewhere else. Um, it's not easy, right? Like it's it's not easy because database uh, databases transaction logs can be really big, and they can be um, 
you know, very verbose. And so you need to be able to be really good at filtering data and telling the database when to delete that transaction log. It's designed to be like an ephemeral, an ephemeral thing. So if a transaction log gets too big, it can blow up the database. Um, so it's a hard uh, way of accessing this type of data, but it's getting simpler. There's a lot of really decent open source systems now that um, have come out and, and made it possible to get at that transaction log. Um, and a lot of great SaaS systems as well. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like that also reminds me, I, I want to say it was like work day when we were at Facebook, we were trying to do something. Like it's not the transaction log per se, but it's something similar where it was like trying to figure out like, okay, when are, when's things actually changing versus just like, you know, pulling that data once every, you know, even every hour, like, like you said, you can totally miss data when you're doing batch. It's like, well, someone could have deleted something. Maybe you missed when something changed, right? Like maybe you completely just missed someone making a change to some piece of data that now you just lose because uh, the database yep. no longer tracks it unless you go to the transaction log. So um, I imagine that's another another benefit is that you just get that complete picture regardless. So. Yeah, yeah, you, you get every single change, every update, insert, and every delete. And um, so that's, that's a great um, benefit, but... Yeah, like a good example of what you were doing at Workday is what if someone did something and for some reason it didn't update the last modified date? Yeah. Um, you wouldn't get that change at all. You'd have no idea that it happens. So um, whenever you're working with like batch means of doing the same thing, you tend to have like a means of doing incremental replication. And then every so often you do a full refresh and then you compare the things and try to figure out what deleted and what didn't. And it's just kind of a mess um, versus being able to to access the data directly. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of like setting all of these things up, I feel like there are generally challenges, whether it's real time, batch, um, et cetera. What do, you, what do you often find with like end users who are trying to set up real time? Like the, what are the problems that and challenges they run into uh, with, with all these different solutions? I think um, a lot of people who come from the world of batch and then, and then come into real time, um, they start like with the hardest thing first, right? You start hearing that you need Kafka. So you run after Kafka and lo and behold, you haven't actually done anything, right? Like you have Kafka. Okay, great. Now you have to get your data into Kafka and out to the systems you care about. And that's going to be a whole bunch of different problems. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. Like you come into the world, you decide to adopt technology before knowing what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so once I think you do know that it's, it can be pretty straightforward to get set up. You can, you know, really, if, if you're working on an analytics use case, you're trying to do CDC into an analytics warehouse or something, there's a lot of good um, technologies that can help with that. Um, I think another thing that's actually still hard though, um, once you've gotten through all of that is uh, transformations, real time transformations are something that there's a lot of work going into, but it's a, a fundamentally difficult problem where each record is coming to you and you have to use, if, if you want to do any stateful transformation, there's a whole bunch of information that you need to use and store pre from previous records that came about to actually do computation on your end. Um, yeah. So that's a, a generally hard problem um, to actually do with low latency. And there's a lot of like really smart companies working on it. Um, making that as simple as, as batch is, is something that, you know, I think is, is not straightforward. But there's a lot of ways to get about it. Like the transformation problem is is being attacked. I'll just co cover like two ways that I think are really cool of attacking it. Yeah. The one one is um, like materialize, right? They're basically keeping the understanding what type of state needs to be held around really well, trying to keep as little as possible, and then optimizing that so that they can always have uh, the each each record will always lead to uh, a new view of the world. Um, and then the second way is just like the way that warehouses are now solving it. So Snowflake is making it possible for you to load it with um, streaming effectively. And so you can use Snowpipe streaming, um, get every single record in Snowflake. It still has a little latency, it has a few seconds of delay. So it's not going to be like a fully real-time system, but um, it's pretty fast. Um, and then for, for real-time analytics or something like that, you can absolutely use it. Um, and then, so one of the other problems with real time uh, systems is that like, usually you're just doing inserts, updates and deletes and your destination is responsible for telling you what that means, right? You can't query a whole bunch of inserts, updates and deletes just with a standard SQL query. So mm -hmm. Snowflake has a solution called dynamic tables that allows you to 
kind of get a table from that that you could actually query. And um, you know, the, the combination of those technologies makes it pretty straightforward to do something with low latency. Yeah. But so in, in terms of transformations, I guess like not not just like how it functions, but I I, you reference like you know people who do batch kind of have to have this like mental shift. What like how do you recommend people do that? Because it is kind of a weird thing, right? Like it's like okay, batch. It's very like okay, I do this every hour, and then maybe I just like run like compare it to the old data, like you reference, like and then do some sort of transform um, to to update it. Uh, what is what is kind of the difference in, in the way people approach it when it's like okay, well now I have this row that just came in how am I supposed to run a query on it? And like, you know, you, you reference like caching that data and it's essentially existing. So you can kind of compare it to the old data, but how does that kind of all operate? Yeah. So I think um, the two systems that I was talking about, like materialize and snowflake, they make it so that you don't have to know anything domain specific really mm -hmm. to do this. You can write a, a standard SQL query and get your answer, which is pretty magical. Um, and I think there's more options like that that are coming, right? Like we have uh, a means of doing that for TypeScript and um, also Python coming. And um, so, yeah, I think the goal, and I think where everything is going here is that you won't have to have this domain specific type of knowledge. Um, currently you do, right? Like you have to understand what's possible within a real time transformation. Cause a lot of the times there's there's certain types of queries that you really just can't execute um, super efficiently. If you're, for instance, doing um, a, a long, a very long lived join. So you're doing usually joins with real time systems are windowed. So they have a, a window of time that you're looking over and that allows you to only store state for a period of time that, that mm -hmm. kind of falls out of a buffer. Um, so that, that windowing is like the tactic that real time systems have classically taken. So, Get, a, get around this really difficult problem. But that's kind of going away more and more. Like the materialized solution gets rid of the need for the window. So does the Snowflake solution. Um, and, you know, there, there are very, uh, various other ones in the market that, that do that as well. But really, like, that amount of state that you're keeping around, that's the, like, key thing that when you're thinking about how you're going to construct um, a transformation that's doing a join um, in real time and how, how it's going to... Um, be constructed. Yeah, I I feel like that makes me think of sim like similar to the way like when I came into the data world, I think Hadoop was like the thing, uh, and now it's like yeah, we still kind of use some of that technology if you're using like Trino or Presto, but like we don't think about it, right? Like you're not thinking about like how do I actually write MapReduce jobs? Like well, I just write a SQL query and it does everything behind the scenes. So it sounds like this is kind of the same way uh transformations in real time is heading is where it go like you'll write a sql query and it will just do all of the actual heavy lifting you know figuring out if there's a window figuring out all of that stuff on its own uh or just removing that all together because it's like don't worry like we we know where the data is you don't have to to, to to deal with that yeah i think that's exactly right um and it's it's getting closer and closer to reality now there's still some rough edges but really I think anyone who looked at it 10 years ago and said, no, this will never happen is now going to start getting the words. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's why it's hard to say anything. In, in like when, whenever anyone asks me, even like, oh, will data engineers be around in 10 years? It's like, that is like so much has changed that's in hard. 10 years in the tech world. Like, I don't know, like who, no one who works, if, you, if someone in the tech world tells you, you know, what it's going to look like they're, I mean, either if, if they get it right, and consistently, I don't know, pay, pay them a lot of money, but they probably won't. Um, they should be in the finance world, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should be making bets over there. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's also been a lot of talk about kind of like the way data infrastructure for analytics should look like recently. Um, do, do you feel like there's there's a good way that people can set up their, their data infrastructure, whether they're doing real time or not, that, you know, they can kind of just be in a good position for themselves? Yeah, I, I think so. I I think, you know, a, a system that has um, the ability to connect to all your data sources with, you know, as I'm just going to throw out a hypothetical, hypothetical um, set of tools that make make a ton of sense to me. So using um, streaming ETL, it, it's great to future proof. Um, it's a little bit hard, but that, that would be a really nice way to set you up for the future. You don't have to do that. 
Um, and of course you can use like a standard batch ETL type vendor or ELT type vendor, but let's, let's call it estuary for the pipes. Um, then flowing into two systems, let, let's say Snowflake and Materialize, um, both of those for various different purposes, one for like truly real-time um, analytic queries uh, for where that matters. And then, um, you know, the other for more of the like larger scale ones um, and then DBT on top of that. Um, and so the, the combination of that um, maybe with um, a new aged uh, type of type of uh, BI tool um, so, you know, Omnigly and something like that. Yeah. Um, I guess they're called half board now. Um, so yeah, like the, that type of thing, I think is where I would be looking at. I'm curious what your answer would be for that though, Ben. <laughs> I, uh, hmm. I think, I mean, probably something somewhat similar. Um, I don't think it would be too, too different. I think I always get stuck on the, the BI side. Only because, yeah. you know, there's a lot of modern solutions like you referenced. Um, but in terms of like where the weight is, uh, yeah. like where people know the technology and which technology is generally chosen, it still, I feel, feels very heavy on the Tableau and Power BI side. So it's always like, look, there are all these solutions. Um, and, you know, some of them are modern. But at the end of the day, Power BI still and, and Tableau, I think, still take up probably most of the market in, in, in that space. Um, and they tend to be uh, initially, at least, you know, when you first start approaching them pricing wise, a little easier to, to handle, right. Until you hit a certain number with, with either of them. But, you know, most of the other BI tools that I know, like have a, a, you know, maybe five figure price tag by the end of the year and just to start. So, you know, it's, it's often easier for someone to just be like, oh, Tableau. Well, that's only, you know, whatever, I don't know what the price is, 80 bucks a month for one, one developer or something. Um, which doesn't, you know, it seems fine until you have a hundred or so, and then you're like, oh, I'm spending a lot of money. But yeah, I, I think that's, that's probably what I'd, I'd say. Something like something similar again, uh, some sort of easy to use tool to get the data into your infrastructure. You reference Estuary. Estuary is a good option. There's plenty of others, but I think that's, that's a good option. Snowflake, um, is still, I think solid. Although I, I, I know I've seen a lot of people, you know, push towards, towards Databricks recently. Um, mm. I feel like that's still for me in my mind, like very ML focused and AI focused or mean AI, but definitely ML focused. Um, and then, yeah, some, something on top like DVT to do transforms and then, yeah. Um, yeah. actually, since I just referenced data breaks, is that something you're seeing just cause like, you know, they, they recently, I think just grew 50% in the last year, uh, in terms of revenue. Is that something you're currently seeing in terms of growth? Yeah, definitely. We see a, a lot of, um, customers that are pushing towards data breaks and it's, um, they tend to be a little bit more technical still of, of users, um, and teams. Yeah. Versus Snowflake. So yeah, I think it, it, you know, usually when we see it, it's, it's teams that also do spark um, mm -hmm. on the back end, and, and that is pretty common. So that's, that's how I've seen it. Um, it's not usually just like an analytics shop. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's generally my feeling where it's like, because it requires just a little more like understanding technically, it's like, it's not always a good fit for everyone where it's like Snowflake. It's like, it's, I think it's a happy medium, like Snowflake or BigQuery where it's like, you can get all the benefit with not having to be necessarily as technical uh, immediately. So that's, it's usually the balance. Of where do you fall on Redshift? <laughs> Redshift, well, I, I haven't like tested out any of it's like, cause obviously at this point it's got newer, newer iterations. They finally added yeah. merge in 2022. So a lot of the things that supposedly were the issues that most of us would complain about, uh, maybe five years ago, um, supposedly are fixed, but I haven't had to use the, the newer version recently. I've had to use, I've had to, uh, more recently re reenact or re, uh, encounter SQL server, uh, than I have had to mm -hmm. re encounter redshift. So, um, yeah, I, I can That's tell you how I used to feel too. about it, but I can't tell you how I feel about it now. Yeah, we see SQL Server all the time. It's like yeah. huge. SQL, yeah, SQL Server is still huge. Like SSIS, SQL Server, like those are still solutions that are have such a dominance in the market. Again, they're just so easy to spin up. They're like free-ish to a degree, right? Like you can kind of just start with it and then maybe eventually figure out what, how to deal with licensing. But 
yeah, there's so many people who will just use it um, either because they learned it or because, you know, that's just an easy option to, to go to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in terms of like direction, is there anything you, you have in terms of thoughts of where real time is headed? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really good question. So like something that is, is happening only is this concept of um, real time having history. So, you know, your, your streaming pipeline in general, streaming pipelines didn't have history. They Kafka started with um, the ability to just retain data to disk. And once you, if you wanted to scale how long you stored data for on disk, so that you could maybe do a, a backfill or something like that. The only option was to um, to add more brokers. So you actually increase the number of um, brokers that you had. And so that's kind of over time been something that has been a big target. Um, I, Pulsar came out, Pulsar was kind of trying to attack the same problem. Kafka added some solutions to it. And you have companies like actually like Gazette. Gazette was a, the, the project that we created that natively backs by cloud storage. Um, and Warpstream just raised a bunch of money and they're doing something similar, which is like um, data storage for, for Kafka. So a lot of different options if, if you want to do that, you know, Astray too, of course. Um, but that's something that I think will be like just built into to streaming systems. When that happens, you'll have the ability to like really think about these systems as having the ability to work with history. And that changes the way that Lambda architectures work in general, um, or you know, the, the requirement from having a Lambda architecture to more like a Kappa architecture. So you could really have like a streaming system that has no gotchas when you're loading destinations with it. Um, and so that's something that I think we see. Um, I'm also seeing that just it's becoming cheaper. Um, so instead of having to manage and, um, and kind of be able to um, manage each component and have a big engineering team that actually does all that um, to, to, to put the pieces like Debezium and Kafka and Kafka Connect and Zookeeper and whatnot, all these other things that you need. Um, you, you manage solutions are making it so that you can do it and it's like no more expensive than batch solutions. I think as that happens, as the as it becomes a little bit more capable, we're just going to see it go fully mainstream, um, especially for the data pipeline side. I think transformations will follow a little bit a little bit later, just because there are a bit of a hard problem still to to solve. But um, that's my prediction. Yeah. No, I think I think I think it makes sense. Um, only because you just referenced it, like you. Uh, like what is Lambda Kappa? Like just for people who don't know. Yeah. So um, basically if you, if, if there's like kind of a few tactics for working with streaming data and, and analytic data. Um, and since you have this problem that streaming systems don't natively hold history or didn't natively hold history, uh, they'd only be really good for uh, problems that you uh, have that are happening right now. So building an operational system which connects um you know a source and a destination and says like when a user clicks on on this this is a really bad example but when when a user clicks on this product and i want to see if we have the inventory for it i have to you know connect to this service and do this thing um so something that's happening right then and now in the um, in the moment for a user and that has to be different than an analytical system which you have to have all of history first. So you couldn't really answer that problem with a with a streaming system. You couldn't ever say how many, um, how much inventory is available for the, uh, so how many orders did you have like over a long period of time with a streaming system. Um, so Lambda architecture emerged to be able to like kind of fuse those two things where you'd have like if one path for certain uh, types of qu- qu- questions. So maybe one path for analytic queries and another path for operational queries. Um, the cap architecture is saying, let's do it a little bit differently. Let's use a streaming system to load both your analytics and, and your um, operational systems. Um, and so that's kind of becoming a little bit more of the path now. Um, I think this is all due to a post by Jay Krebs, who is the founder of Confluent back in like, I don't know, 2014, 2015, um, where he proposed the Kappa architectures and that's um that's kind of how it how it's stuck yeah okay 
Yeah, that's a at this point now, 10 years ago, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, again, the data world, the data world changes, but also I feel like doesn't change that much to some degree. Um, uh, oh, someone did ask a question, and I at least wanted to kind of frame it somewhat, maybe possibly differently, just because I feel like I've seen some people recently do some some benchmarking. So they're asking, like, you know, how, how do you kind of read those benchmarks, especially if like more than likely uh, some of these companies kind of bake them as I assume when he says bake carefully, uh, it means like, you know, kind of fine tune it to make sure you're, you're never going to release a benchmark that shows your your company was worse. Yeah, that's uh, it's a good question. I think, you know, everyone struggles with this because it's exactly what you said. There's no incentive to release a benchmark that, that shows that um, you're slower than another technology. Um, so I think it's good to like look at them. I'm sh it's good to try to understand, like when you're reading a piece of content in the news today, you don't read the content and say, oh, this is exactly what happened. You think like, well, what does this actually mean? Um, and as long as you're you're looking at it with that type of mentality, I think it's totally fine. And you can kind of say, well, th that's good that this one metric was, you know, higher in this specific sense. Um, is that what I, is that the metric I need? Is that actually going to help me? You know, what's the metric that matters for me? Um, and so, as long as you're thinking about it with eyes wide open and and kind of like going that path, that's that seems like a a pretty reasonable approach to me. Um, but yeah, benchmarks are only as valuable as, uh, the paper you wrote it on most of the time. Yeah. I, I feel like it was last, it was, it was like two years ago at this point where it was like Snowflake and Databricks writing like articles back and forth, like, no, we're cheaper. No, we're cheaper. And it was just like, all right, uh, everyone's just <laughs> like, you're never, again, you're never going to release an article that shows you're, you're more expensive than your, your competitor or, or whatever the, the current metric you're trying to, to go on speed, cost. Um, what about other things? Um, so I think that's, that's kind of kind of an interesting point. Um, I don't know if, if, if you've got something for this question, but someone's asking, is there a way to optimize an upsert behavior, which I'm not sure about the upsert behavior from streaming like Kafka into Microsoft SQL Server. I know ClickHouse is faster, yeah. but most likely banking organizations stick to use SQL Server. Yeah, so this is actually um, a, a really interesting question. Um, so I can tell you about our tactic for it. Um, and this is just because like we've tried a lot of things and this tactic feels like it works really well. We use optimis uh, optimistic um, uh, crunching of the actual data. So we keep on adding data to a transaction while we're waiting for the previous transaction to, to finish. And so that what that means is we do an upsert. Um, and as the database is, is kind of processing that upsert, we're taking all of the incoming transactions from our streaming system and we're taking them and making them into the next merge query that we're going to load. And that tends to be the fastest way that we can load um, the database without really overwhelming it, right? Like we're not going to be issuing parallel queries to like really overwhelm that database. We're only doing like one at a time. Um, so that's, that's the way we do it. Um, it, it is a little bit slower, of course, when you're doing an upsert and you're actually reducing the data into your destination, than if you were to just be inserting records, you can mm -hmm. obviously get that a little bit faster. But you know, if you we we provide both of those as options uh, for loading the the database and um, just let the user choose if they care more about latency or if they care more more about having an exact view in their destination. Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. I'm glad you've actually dealt with the problem. Um, I feel I feel like streaming forces you to deal with a lot of a lot of problems in in, in general. Where it's like, <laughs> yeah, batch every you, problem you, you get away you get away, you get away with a lot in, in the batch world because it's just like, well, I mean, well, if it's not working today, we'll fix it like in an hour from now. So it's, it's not not the end of the world. Um, so you, yeah, yeah, you see how fast systems are too, and you're thinking in terms of milliseconds and. And then you're working with like an analytic warehouse or something, and they're thinking in terms of you know minutes. Yeah. It's a it's a very different um, way of loading. Do you, do you feel like there's certain warehouses that don't do well um, there, or, or maybe you've just had issues with where you're like, oh man, like they pick you know SQL Server, and I'm trying to do real time, but I'm getting like there's like a bottleneck now trying to ingest that data essentially. I think databases are usually pretty fast. Okay. Um, Warehouses tend to be a little bit slower. Um, and 
it, I think what happens is that sometimes users have a bit unrealistic expectations where they throw an extra small warehouse at us to load a bunch of data. They throw, you know, a hundred gigabytes an hour and they say, why aren't you keeping that database up to, you know, up to the second? And we're like, well, that's not, that's not us. That's, that's your database. That's your data warehouse. Um, if you increase the size of it, we could probably load it a lot faster, but like it's, it's unrealistic, um, just for them to do the processing and do an upsurge in that period of time. Yeah. Yeah. No, so. that, that, that part makes sense. I think in, in terms of like, yeah, uh, a lot of data coming into, especially like, I don't, I don't know what an extra small is supposed to handle, but I, I imagine that would be too much, uh, in a short period of time. So, um, I can see that being a problem. Um, cool. I'm trying to see, I don't think we have any other questions. Oh, do you have any other thoughts in terms of real time, the way real time is going? Um, no, I think, um, yeah, this is, this is good. Thanks for having me a lot of, uh, Good discussion here. Yeah, no, a lot of good discussions. Uh, I, I did give you a, a shout out in the comments for, for both you so people can find you on LinkedIn, but also Estuary. So if anyone is looking for David, you can check that out, on, especially on LinkedIn. If you're on YouTube, I also have those both in the description. So you guys can check out uh, you know, David and Estuary. Um, they're, they're doing real time, essentially uh, ELT. Um, so they, I know you've got, you guys have actually been working on the transform more, right? Like how's that? How are you guys feeling in the yeah. transform space? Yeah, so ours, um, the way that we've targeted our transforms, it's not meant for like analytics use cases, really. So it's not something where you're having an analyst write like a standard SQL query. Um, they're, they're more meant for operational transforms. So that's like long-lived reshaping of data, um, kind of maybe doing something that you would do to massage your data into um, a, a format that, you, you believe that like everything in a warehouse should be loaded with. So um, that type of reshaping. Um, and so that's that's where it is. Um, we offer SQL and TypeScript right now. We're actually gonna add Python pretty soon. Nice. That's pretty, for, for us, that's a really interesting one for, for like Gen AI use cases. Um, you can actually do in in pipeline transformations and, and kind of augmentation. No. Oh, okay. Is that is that something you feel like people are like needing right now, like doing some some? Is it like chatbots in real time? Like, what do you what do you envision people will do with that? Yeah, a lot of people are are aiming for like a, a chatbot in real time um, that that can power something on their site. So, funneling in some of their data from maybe um, their different services and being able to use that uh, on a chatbot on their site. That's um, one of the things that we get asked for a lot. Um, and I think that like having an ability to do transformations in real time that like solidifies the whole offering there. Yeah, yeah. Is it kind of like, do you view it like what uh, the Klarna kind of example maybe kind of did where, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, where like they're like, oh, we were able to, we, we have like seven, we're doing like, we built a chatbot that now essentially handles a certain number of kind of our employees workload because it kind of like knows the customer from like this almost 360 point of view. So I imagine some component of that is like it's streaming it to a central system uh, and then, you know, being able to have these conversations with customers because it's like, oh, we know, we know what problem you're having, right? So you probably want to have up to date information, especially if you're doing like customer uh, service type things, because if they're having a problem, they just had the problem and they're calling you now because, you know, like, oh, my, mm -hmm. I, you know, whatever, my credit card or something's not working. I need this fixed. So. Yeah, and I think the coolest way for us to show that it's um, just like a preview of some of our plans is just to like actually dog food it ourselves. So come to our site and our chatbot will be powered by you know, our system. Oh, awesome. Um, so that's that's not available yet right now. It's oh. in desk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, you're giving it, you're giving us hope. So you know you, you should build that, and then you know you can just you can just sell that. We'll instead. talk about and it, then, and then uh, tell. <laughs> Tell all the CEOs you're like, I will we'll add AI to, to your company, and they'll be like, All right, great. Uh, I can make my board happy because they've been asking me to do that for the last. I time. added AI. <laughs> yeah, we we have AI now. And like, well, what what does it do? It handles. It's just. I think that's the one interesting thing in in that space where it's like it still feels like it sounds like it's a chatbot, maybe a better chatbot, which or like a better like phone call experience than currently exists, which is just a telephone tree. Um, and then you're just yelling on the other side, you know, representative, representative. I don't, want, you know, just give me, yeah. just skip, skip over this. Yeah. What is Gen AI? It's really just like a new way of doing search at some level, um, like a really, really powerful and effective way of doing search. But 
like as long as we're thinking about the problem in terms of that, it's it's a great solution. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, like I think there is a little bit of danger of it becoming going the way that crypto kind of did, where this huge Web three craze and everything came out, and that was the that was the future of the world. But I, it's a little for me, it's a little bit more capable than than something like uh, blockchain technology. Yeah, no, it really is that like next. I, I, people are always looking for that next X S curve. So it's just like maybe this is it. So. Yeah. You know, they're always going to throw in a ton of money, just hoping that that it is the, the next thing. Even if it's if it is, if it isn't, if it if it's just a smaller thing uh, that maybe leads to a bigger thing, um, you know, I, I mean, we'll only ever tell in like five or ten years when it's like, oh yeah, no, it really was this big, and this is why, right? Like again, like the web was like that, where it was like, yes, they were right, but they were also wrong, right? Like you, you put money yep. in into pence.com you you lost a ton of money um <laughs> even though you were kind of but, right you were just you know too early you spent too much money um on the, on the wrong in the wrong space so but amazon.com when you were set yeah i mean had it been amazon.com you would have you know you, you would not be working right now um but that's just just how it goes cool well I, we don't have any other questions coming in don't want to keep you too long david anything else that people should know about you um, just if you want to come to, um, if you're interested in real-time data, you can sign up for a free Estuary account. We give 30 days of free usage um, at estuary.dev, and um, you know we're happy to help. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. And then, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll kind of say goodbye, and thanks for everyone for watching, and I'll hit end stream.